Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. It's another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Today, I'm joined by Grandmaster Steve Damasco. Thank you for being here. We'll start our conversation in just a moment. But for those of you out there, if you're new, make sure you visit whistlekick.com. Make sure you're following us everywhere. If you're a listener to this show, remember, we do video of every episode. Check that out at YouTube. Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for everything, transcripts, show notes, you know, I'm sure we're going to link some things, your website, your social media, all that stuff from this. So if you want to go deeper, make sure you do that. But thanks for being here. Oh, appreciate, my appreciate you coming on. So here we are, we're, we're in an office in at Keene State College. Both of my two out of the three boys I had went to Keene State. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and you, you live, I'm still in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> My son had a full scholarship for basketball. Oh, nice. Hated the school. I mean, really? Full, 100% full. Is and that then, is that why you came here? No, no I, I try to stay away from this place. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I doubly appreciate it. He hated, hated the school. Really? And then came to Keene State to play, which okay. they don't pay. Yeah. So like I say, I'm still in therapy. <laughs> and, I am, and I am a behavioral psychologist. <laughs> oh, are you? Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I, have a great, I have a graduate. I don't practice. Well, I practice every day. But yeah, I'm sure. I, uh, I have a graduate degree in behavioral psychology. Okay. Uh, it doesn't take much effort to see how that could become relevant in teaching it is. martial it, it, arts. It's, it's, it's relevant in terms of um, my, my studios because we, we actually have um, healthcare professionals that uh, send kids to us mm -hmm. because they're, every one of my instructors come from within. I don't hire outside black mm -hmm. They all come from within. Mark, you train them an up. interview is 39. And he's yeah. been with me since he was six. Wow. Okay. Just an example. But uh, they, uh, you know, I train them in dealing with kids with ADD, ADHD, learning disabilities, uh, oppositional defiances, Tourette's, mm. uh, autism. So they're literally trained by me to deal with wow. kids like that. Okay. So Mark has been, especially Mark, because he's been with me the longest, well, one of the longest, but uh, he, he's, he's incredible with, with kids. Where, where did the interest in that for you come from that you went to school for it uh, for uh, psychology yeah because both my dad and my stepfather were idiots <laughs> <laughs> um you know I, I i had a very very difficult life growing up i mm. grew up uh, in spanish Harlem, new york i thought it was puerto rican until i was seven really yeah my mother never told me my mother lived in a hospital for 18 years of her life a catholic hospital and she lost her legs when she was nine so my dad was, my biological dad was really bad. So we lived in Spanish Harlem together, her and I, a woman with no legs and an eighth grade education. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you, you know, I read a book a long time ago in grad school and it said it was a, a, a man's search for meaning. Mm -hmm. And it was about, and I know this is, but it is really martial art related in sure. a way that they wondered, that he, he was a psychiatrist and he was in the concentration camps mm -hmm. and he was, he took as many notes as he could on why people, some people survived the cramps and others ones did, didn't. And to make a long story short, the ones that survived lived for somebody else. They had a reason. They had a reason to live yeah. where the other ones, they, they knew that their family was gone. So, you know, using the, the information growing up in the streets from New York, I went to Brockton, Massachusetts. I used to fight in high school. It's I another tough town. I, well, yeah, tell me about it. I learned how to fight because I was getting my ass kicked that whole time, you know. So I This I, is all pre martial arts. This is pre martial arts. I fought out of the Rocky Marciano gym. Okay. You know, and I had and I had a good instructor, a good I wanted, you know, I remember my first fight, okay, and I'm sitting in the back. It wasn't glorious, you know, they're wrapping my hands and the guy that I'm gonna fight is sitting right next to me. And he uh, I said he see, looks at me and says, How many fights has you had? I said, oh, I had a few. I hadn't had any other than sparring. And I said, How many do you have? He said, Oh, 15, 14 knockouts. So now I'm trying to keep a straight face, yeah. okay, and not show pain and but fear. That, that's, that's <laughs> I had no, I had not had a, a an amateur, a little legitimate, and a fight at that point other than sparring. Right, right. So we get in the ring. I don't know what happened. The bell rang, and the next thing I know, I had knocked them out. <laughs> that's not the, That's not what I'm bragging about. So I come in the next day. Okay, now you got to be. This was the, the Rocky Marciano gym was not a glorious place. It wasn't a beautiful place. You, had, you know those bars that open up at eight o'clock in the morning and they start drinking. Yeah. And you use the bathroom only if you're dying. Yeah. Okay, so you walk through the bar to get to the gym, which was behind it. It was a so, gym in a dive bar. It was a boxing gym in the dive behind the dive behind bar. the dive bar, it, but attached. So he, 
I mean, so so Giggy Sergio was a, a mafia guy. He was a bookie. So he sponsored us kids. And I walk in after that fight. I had won. I, I was like shocked. The guy had never had 15 fights. But he, he said he was that, just he was yeah, just, he'd BS and yeah. I walk in in front of everybody. <clears throat> you know, I'm Italian and I'm obviously animated in front of everybody. I say, Vinny. And he's in the ring with uh, training somebody. Vinny, I'm quitting school. I'm going to be a next middleweight champion of the world. And now I could do that. I left home at 16. And, and I, you meant it. I meant it. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he says, get in the car. No, he says, change up. So after he gave me a beating, which he never did, that was the first from him. He says, get in the car. He drives me to the high school. And he takes me to the principal. And our school has 7,200 kids in it, mm -hmm. Brock and I. Yeah. He took me to the headmaster of all four sections. And he said, if Steve misses one more day of school, if he could, no, he didn't say that. If Steve quits school or thinks he's going to quit school, you need to call me right away. Yeah. So there is a moral to the story. So when he did that, brought me back, we, we trained, and I never quit school. Mm. This is just one guy. Okay, he wasn't a touchy, he was Italian, but he wasn't a touchy feely guy. But you knew he cared. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure you knew a marvelous Marvin Hagler. Yeah. He was my best friend. Really? I started him out boxing. No way. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because he came to me. We used to call him short stuff. Okay. How did you it, meet him? We went to Brockton High together. Okay. So he came to me. He knew I was boxing. I mean, I lived with, uh, with, with African Americans when I left home at 16, lived with them. So I was, they protected me. Yeah. And he, and they said, Steve, can you, can you get me into the, to the gym? And I said, yeah, I'll talk to Vinny, but there was no room. There wasn't enough lockers. Mm. So I sent him a Petronelli and history was the rest of it. But it was that one guy, that one time that changed my life. Mm. Think about it. I don't know if I would have been the middleweight champion of the world. I sure would have tried like hell, sure. but but you I have a graduate in degree in psychology. Right. I, I went to the White House. I was a spokesperson for the President of the United States for five years on it on school violence and gangs. Mm -hmm. I traveled all over the country. Mm -hmm. None of this stuff would have ever happened except for so, that one so guy. Let's talk about that moment. So you come in, you're riding high on this win. Mm -hmm. You're declaring your intention. And he says, no, no you're not. No, no expression on it. No, he didn't even say no. There was no expression on your face. Yeah. He said, change up, we'll work out, gives me a beat and takes me to the high school. What was your, what were you thinking at that point? Because here, this is obviously someone that you look up to. Yeah, I respect and tremendously. And you had a compelling, a dream. And he's not in words, but telling you, this is not what you are going to do yeah. right now. Was it, was you know, it hurtful? Was it disappointing? I, you know, I'll tell you what it was. Um, I didn't know what he was thinking to begin with. He had no expression on his face. When I told him all of this, everybody looked at me at the gym. I, I thought I was cool, but change up, work out. I had no idea what he was thinking until he told me. Even when he told us, get in my car after I changed back up and going to the high school, I had no idea mm. what he was, what he, what, what he was going to do. But, you know, and that is the, the moral of the story is not to tell you everything in my life, but that is how... You know, a martial art organization or even a martial art school is 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 directed. It, the philosophy comes from the master, mm -hmm. the grandmaster. So whatever that philosophy is, no matter how you were trained, 99 percent of the time, that's the way you're going to run your school. That's the philosophy you're going to use. Right. OK. And that has been my philosophy from day one. I mean, why don't I practice? Why don't I open up a I mean, uh, 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 a mental health clinic? Mm -hmm. It's because this is the only thing on the planet, this sport. I have trained gang members, okay? My school in Connecticut, when I was in Connecticut, I had an office there, and it was one building. And on one side of that building was uh, an alternative school. Mm -hmm. These were like ex-gang members, all gang members, mm -hmm. wannabes, and they're the worst, okay? I mean, they had to go through a metal detector. There was only like 15 of them in that school, mm -hmm. all right? And I went and I talked to the headmaster there. I said, I'll train them. Oh, he came to me and asked me if I would, because he had heard about the things I've done with kids. These kids had the jeans down here. They're yep. showing their rear ends. They got, the, they got the, the earrings. They got tattoos all over them. They got the necklace. They got all of that. I said, uh, and then I talked to them, and I told them where I came from. See, it doesn't take me long mm. to know that I'm one of them. You can relate. Totally relate. I grew up in the same areas. I had the, you know, I had the same no fathers. I had the, you know, you know the same, we were same. And I said, I'll train you, but you're going to take all that stuff off 
okay? You're going to pull up your pants when you walk into the foyer, all right? As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you the uniform, and you're going to put it on here with none of this bling on. Mm -hmm. They walked into this. They would come around to, my, to, to the other side of the building, and they would walk into the studio. You would not believe the transformation. And that's what's beautiful about this industry if you're a good instructor, if you're able to connect. And that is, we're all the same. There isn't a sport on the planet like that. Think about it. Baseball is not dependent on one guy. Football, any of those sports, cocky, any of those things are, is not dependent on one person. But when you, as a, as a student of the martial arts, it's just you. There might be a lot of people and you're all the same. You don't know whether you're standing next to a brain surgeon or a gang member because we all look the same. And there isn't anything on the planet that does that except martial arts. And that whole Vinny story, okay, about that one guy that changed my life is the philosophy that I have trained my instructors. I don't claim to have the best martial artists in the world, okay? I don't. They're good. They're good. I claim to have the best instructors. Mm. And that has been my philosophy. And this is such an ego-driven business. I don't play that game. I just don't. You know, they put the belt, you know, I, I've been this in a long time. You know that, okay? I've been all over the world. And because I was used to be in the entertainment business after high school and co going through college, but I had to travel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would go to any karate school, like a martial arts school I could get into to train. You know, they put that belt around their waist. Think about this, okay? They were black belt. Mm -hmm. You got people coming in all day long, a black belt. Now, if you've done, I don't know what you are or how long you've been doing this, but that's, a you know, not to be philosophical, but that's a beginner. And they put that belt and people come in bowing to them all day long. Think about the psychology of that. Okay. All day long. Ego and then uh, ego, you keep, most people can't handle that. Right. And they've stopped. You know what the worst, you know what the diseases of that black belt around your waist? You start to believe it. And that is a problem. No, none of them for years and years should not get that kind, you know, get that kind of acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. I mean, respect is with both people. You know, every time I give a black belt test, okay, and when I was an instructor just teaching in school, in the school years ago, I would bow and, they, and bow together and I'd ask them, do you know why I bow? Out of respect, out of respect for you. And you do it out of respect for me. They were on a, I've been around thousands of martial artists. There's not many people that actually live that. They preach it, a, 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 an industry that's predicated, respect, self-discipline, self-control. Really? We talk I'm about that a lot on the show. I, I'm not t saying everybody's like that. No, no. I but I got to tell you, the majority of instructors are like that. So... Let me let me pose something to you because yeah. one of the arcs over this show from early days, we're we're coming up on our ninth, mm -hmm. celebrating our, our our ninth years. Well, finishing our ninth year, starting our tenth. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you know, and maybe you're uniquely qualified with your academic experience uh -huh. to to respond to this, but it seems to me that a lot mm -hmm. of these folks who get promoted up and they end up with these very inflated egos. It's because their instructors didn't temper their ego when they were younger and lower rank. Yeah. That they saw, you know what? You know why? So and so is a jerk. Let me help them become a better person. But you know what? They can do their forms, they can do their techniques. They're a good fighter. I'm going to give them their yellow, blue. And sometime around, you know, depending on the system, brown, red belt, whatever, they realize I kind of missed the boat. If yeah. I hold them here yeah. until they're a good person, it's going to take them five years. They're going to quit. I can tell you exactly why that Please. happens. Okay? It's like being a parent mm. and a child. The kids will always emulate their parents. Mm. You know, if you hate, if you're racist, if you're biased, if you swear, mm. if you smoke... 90% of the time, that's what the same kid, the kids will do that. Right. I have seen it multiple times. I have kids that have come into our school at the beginning, and they're always respectful. Mm. And if they're not, we teach them how to be respectful. Walk out of the dojo, okay? 
mom, go get me a water. Now, parents, 90% of the time, unless they have special needs, will come into the school and say, we ask them why they want to bring the child to the school. And they'll say, he's, he's arrogant or he, has, he doesn't listen and blah, blah, blah. But the problem with that is that once the kid leaves the dojo, the parents don't reinforce that. So it makes our job extremely difficult. What are we going to see him two or three times a week? Yeah. So you, the question, the answer to your question is, they will emulate. they the, the the instructor is the parent. They will emulate exactly the ego that they have. Mm. Why wouldn't they? So if 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 because I can prove that I've, I I had fifty schools at one time. And I would make sure because they all come from within that this is the way that school was run, exactly. Because I would talk to parents, they had a line to me. They all had a line to me. They all had my cell phone number. They all had my email address. Okay, and if I ever got an email or something derogatory, it was usually about, they didn't want to pay for testing. <laughs> <laughs> so no, that's, that's the problem. You know, so they think that they're being, they, they think that they're being humble the instructor. They think that they're, personifying respect, self-discipline, self-control. But they're not. Because if they're not, their mm. students aren't. They are the parent. And if you and if you disagree, I'd be happy to listen to you. I, I, I don't. Okay. I don't. You know, I, I find I find the psychology around ego to be really interesting and because we get too much of it too soon. Yeah. And, I, and you know, I, I look at I look at my own personal journey. You know, I started extremely young. I earned my black belt as a, a late teenager. And I was good. Mm -hmm. I was at a school that was good and I was good in that school. And I had, oh, here's Andrew with your water. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And it took me a long time to understand that what, what I needed. Now I, I had, you know, some challenges in my, my home upbringing, but you know, my, my mother kept me humble, but it's, it's, it's almost like it's a power. Right. You know, the skills that we have and the standing that we occupy is kind of like a power. It's you know, an over exaggerated power. The, the cliche. That's my, my definition. Yeah, of it. The, the cliche of power corrupts. Right. And so you hand a 16 year old the power of a black belt. Do they have necessarily the, the life experience no. to, to use it? And, and in my case, you know, I it ultimately I, I found my way and I, I was very blessed that I had two wonderful instructors who were like parents to me. And they continue to guide me. And, and you know, my, my mother was my mother. And, and she made sure that, you know, I didn't have too big of a head. And, uh, but I see what you're talking about. So I, I absolutely don't Yeah, I mean, disagree. Uh, I mean, um, again, it's, it's, it's going to, it, you know, it all flow, flows downhill. And I've told people multiple times, even in interviews, I said, I hate this industry. Mm. Hate it. Because of all of this stuff, right. I've seen it. I've seen it for so long, and I've never been like that. But I love what I do. Mm. And I mean, if I didn't, I know what we do, what I do, what they do. We have changed lives. We've taken kids off medications, right. okay, because they know how to deal with that. The, I mean, when a, when a when a psychologist will refer their kids to us, that tells you something. It does and it's because we have changed their lives, and that's that. I mean, there's nothing better than that. I mean. Yeah. I can't, do I want to sit in front of somebody and listen to their problems all day long? Oh, how do you feel about that? What are you kidding me? But I'm not that kind of person. You tell me I have this bad habit of doing this with women. Okay, stop. <laughs> <laughs> not, I'm not going to look at you like, a, we're all trained the same in psychotherapy. All the same, because the normal, the normal response to that is, how do you feel about that? Yeah. Or why do you think you do that? <laughs> I mean, really. So it's really, again, the philosophy of the instructor that, and the actions of the instructor, the philosophy they have. Mm. We all say we teach uh, bully-proof schools and we, yep. and we, we, we you know, I'm, I'm not here to badmouth schools. I'm here for these people that are listening to, to maybe, one, maybe I can get to them. Maybe they can see exactly what I'm saying and understand that and change a little bit of the philosophy they're using in their schools. Yeah. Because I've seen more of that than I've seen more of this. Of what, my... what, what, I, what I suspect some of the audience is taking from this is that there are probably some folks out there who agree with you, believe what you're saying, 
but what you're saying is not the common it's not and, discussion and, it, and, and so you're going to give them confidence to lean into it a little bit more to be a little bit more confident and and to a certain degree pushy right. because there's an with old, their students their assistant instructors their schools whatever nobody and wants make to admit, more of a nobody wants to admit they've made mistakes especially black belts Except okay. that we all do every day. Yeah, but I mean, when I say mistakes, I mean mistakes in their in their philosophy. Oh, uh, sure, mistakes sure. in how they are as instructors. Yeah, no one's they're going to look at me and say, you know, there's an old saying: people against, you know, trying to convince somebody against their will is the same opinion still. You know, so they're they're going to they're going to look at me and call me an asshole. You know what I mean? Steve thinks he's all of that, and he's got the best schools. I I, I don't think that. I'm just simply saying that. This is the my this is the philosophy, and why is that? I was fortunate enough to grow up with a woman that had four fingers on one hand, no legs, lived in a Catholic hospital for eighteen years of her life, okay, and became the founder for the Head Start program in the state of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which required a four year college degree. And the most humble experience. So I had that. I looked at her. She mm -hmm. never complained a day. She had multiple operations, mm -hmm. multiples. She didn't even know her legs were going to be removed when she went in for that operation. Okay? Multiple. And when Head Start, do you know what Head Start is? Okay, so head, ones that don't. Head Start is a program that was designed for women, okay, that want to educate themselves or work, and they don't have some single families. They don't have somebody to mm -hmm. watch their kids. So they bring them to Head Start. They get educated. The kids get educated. That when it was an experimental program, and this this is the most this has stayed with me for my entire life, and I've been humbled a lot. Trust me, okay. I mean, when you leave home at sixteen, you think you and you make it, you think you're all that, okay. And so I'm not. I didn't escape from any of that either. <laughs> I did in the dojo because I had my mom to, to use an example, but the rest of my life, forget about it. Uh, so. It, once she once it became, it was an experimental program. She worked 60 hours a week for over a year. Mm -hmm. And they did that all over the country. Okay. And when the job became available, okay, it required a four-year college degree. They had it printed. It was a federal job. Mm -hmm. And she had an eighth grade education. Mm -hmm. I was out of my mind. I wanted to do damage, physical damage to something. I walked up to my mother and I said, Ma, she said, I didn't get the job. And she was so calm about it. And I said, Ma, aren't you upset about that? And she looked at me. And this is so important. And she said, Stevie, I'm just happy that such a great program is going to help so many people. 60 hours a week for a year. And, and think about the humiliation that she had an eighth grade education and it required a four-year degree. She was just happy it was going to be a federal funded program. It wasn't about her. Oh my God. I mean, think about that dichotomy. That's, that's huge. Huge. And I, I've been trying, ever since then, I've tried to emulate mm -hmm. that. That Have I done it? I'm, I think, to the best of my, my knowledge, to my, at my age, yes, I have. Um, but there was a book. And I'm not a big reader. I'm a writer. I've written children's books. Oh, oh. You know, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and it was called Looking Out for Number One by Robert Ringer. And it's still on the shelves. I was 20, okay. 19. So a couple of years ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm reading this book. And I'm going, oh, my God. I'm just like this guy. I mean, I identified. I was mm. him. Other than I didn't have as much money as him. Okay. I was him. And I'm reading this and I'm like, and I keep emphasizing this because I mean, I don't get attached to people like that, but I was him. This guy and I are the same. I'm destined for wealth and happy, you know, all of that. Then the, about halfway through the book, <laughs> he said, these are the 10 traits of people you should stay away from. And I'm reading this. Now I was with my brother-in-law. We're riding from Florida because I helped him move. And I'm sitting in the car. He's the driver. And I'm reading this. Number one, number two, I went through 10. And the more I'm reading this, the whiter my face gets. White, white. He pulled over. He thought I was having an, a, a, an anxiety attack. Talking about you. Yeah, me. Here I am, totally engrossed in this guy that I am the same. And the only reason I didn't get 10, number 10, because it had to do with how much money yet, you know, they have. 
And he said, those are the 10 people you need to stay. I qualify for nine out of 10. Okay. You know, and so and people that are listening got to understand that I'm not the guy that's trying to tell you I'm the best on the planet or my, you know, my schools, because I wouldn't be telling this story. Right. So that, I mean, I even get, you know, a little, a little anxious here talking about that. It, it, it killed me. But it sounds like it changed you. It helped change me. I was still young. But I said, I looked at him and I said exactly what I just said to you. And I looked at him and I said, Greg, I don't know why any, anybody even likes me. Mm. <laughs> and, and, and it's those, my mom and those kind of that lesson in life that when I became, I, I always studied martial arts after, oh, I went to college and I, I had to yeah, give up boxing. So at some point go, we got to talk about how you. Yeah. So it was, going. it was that, it was that philosophy, but between my mother and that book that said, Steve, you're a, you're a, you're an asshole. Mm. You know, your ego is out of control. You know, and, and I, I understood why, not that it's right. You know, you leave home at 16, you have bad father, bad, bad stepfather. I, I, I would, I mean, I would be nine years old, eight years old doing my bicycle route, paper route, which I was too young to do. So I lied about my age and I would come home and the milkman would be at the door and I'd give him my money. So mm -hmm. I, from that day on, I've always supported my sisters financially mm -hmm. and my mom. So I just, that just devastated, that just mm -hmm. destroyed me that day. And I'm glad it happened because it, it, it was, it led the path of where I want, where I, wh what I was working towards. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've worked so hard to get that, that instructor to be that because that's what I am. That's what I am. And that's the philosophy I use. We don't, you know, I studied in schools because I traveled a lot. You know, the martial art industry, when you're studying with a, a Japanese or a Korean, is a Chinese, you fit into their box. Right. And I have trained their people that we don't fit into the box. This is not the Shaolin Temple. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is not the Shaolin Temple. These people pay us money. We are their servant. Mm -hmm. There was a whole thing on, I used to be an adjunct professor at UNH. And I taught uh, ph philosophy of business. Mm -hmm. And there was a whole, a whole philosophy behind what we calling ser being a servant person. And that is what I do with them. You are a servant person. You're in the service business. Do you know what service means? You know what I mean? I'm not asking you that question. Okay. But how many people really live that? I'm the instructor. Right. You're here for me. Yeah. Exactly. What, but what's an instructor without students? You know, we, we make but that joke on the yeah, show. It's exactly. teaching to an empty room. Exactly. And but they, but how many have changed really? How long you've been around a while? It, and so let me, let me ask you this because it feels like, and, and you're in a great position to, to talk about this. For me, as the internet came up, a lot mm -hmm. of the, 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 the trappings, the, the mist that a lot of instructors used to maintain their standing in their bubble because most of them like this were in a bubble, right? Their students couldn't go anywhere else. They couldn't do any, anything else. You know, they had magically discovered the best fighting system on the planet and the greatest instructor who had won all, you know, all of the world titles. But the internet comes along and shows people. Yeah, and it really, it's not, it's not yeah. quite that, that cut and dry. Yeah. So I'm starting to see that, that that stuff seems to be fading away that because they can't remain in a bubble because of what's gone on in, in MMA showing people, you know, that, that there goes the argument that we have the best fighting system on the planet. Cause you know, there is no cut and dry. This is the only thing that works, right? The best thing that works. It seems like people that are coming up and as someone with, with some great instructors, they are a little bit more willing to be servants. Well, that's you possible. Think? You talk to more martial artists than I do. I, I, I make it a point to stay away from them. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and again, I don't mean that in a bad no, way. No, it's I just that it. I, I've traveled the world. I mean, I mean, what do you think of when I went to Sicily? Because my family's from Italy and Sicily. Okay. So <laughs> this is beautiful. I was in the sticks of Sicily. Like there wasn't even a store. And I see this cave opening of a cave, I mean, a stone cave, an opening. And it said, Bruce Lee Kung Fu. 
<laughs> I mean, now you got to picture this, okay? Picture yourself in the middle of the Mojave Desert and seeing this, okay? That's what it felt like where I was. Bruce Lee, and I'm okay with that. So I, I said, Kelly, I was with my wife. I was on my honeymoon. I said, Kelly, we got to go in there. So I go in there and I walk in and at the end, and it wasn't that big, but it was big enough. There's a guy in the same outfit, that striped orange yep. thing that Bruce Lee wore, yep. okay? And there's no students. And he knows I'm there. And he's doing this to the bag. I'm going, and he won't look at me. <laughs> so his ego, I know he was Italian, so I'm going to, I might you, use that. You, as a, you were the I guy go, in the middle of we're nowhere. Talking, I was married in 1985, okay? You know, and I was teaching then. It was I had my one I had one school. It was me. I yeah, taught, yeah. and I saw this, and I said, "This just reinforced that this industry does that yeah. to to these guys." I mean, I'm in the middle of the Mojave Desert, only in Sicily, and the guy won't even look at me. And I could speak a little Italian. I know the Sicilian dialect's different, but he wouldn't even look at me. So I walk right up to him, shake his hand. And, and explain to him as best I could that mm. I have a school, you know, martial artist doing this. I mean, he was just, as, you know, it was, I mean, it, I, I don't have to go any further with this. No. You know what I'm going <laughs> with this. Okay. But that is like the, that is just the epitome of what I see out there. And that's why I can honestly say I hate the industry, but I love what I do because of the effect. If you are a good instructor, if that is really, if you emulate the philosophy that you say you teach then that's a good thing. And I have seen those instructors. Too. So so here's a question. Though, Dave. It, it would seem that it could be very easy, 50 schools at one point, which means at least 50 instructors under you. Yeah, it, I would assume yeah, more. Well. Um, we do some rough math, mm -hmm. thousands of students. Yeah. It seems like it could be easy to let Humility or the idea of service get Absolutely. away from Absolutely, human nature is human nature. How how did you how did you hold on to that? Because the way you're talking about this now, and I want, I want to set this up right. The way you're talking about this now, reading that book, and how pivotal that was for you realizing I am the type of person I don't want to be, and it sounds like you invested a tremendous amount of energy, if not also time, to improve yourself. Can't imagine you'd want to backslide. So how do you keep? How do you and how did you? Keep yourself from doing that. I was, I was an animal. Okay. Okay. I worked 20, 20 I went seven days a week. Yeah. I was in every, I, I had those 50 schools in three states, yeah. New York, Long Island, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Okay. All right. And I would, I did all the testing mm. for this at that time. And I would be in, I wouldn't do one school at a time, obviously. I would, in, in, in like where we had, um, let's hypothetically, we had 12 schools in New Jersey. So I would do two tests and we would combine the students in the biggest schools. But I had the instructors there. And every month, every month, I would be in all three of those states testing. Yeah. And they would have to listen to that. And I would watch first because I would say, okay, take the students through the basics. And then tell them what you, and then start the test. I would watch them do it. And if I saw what you know I'm looking for, we'd have a problem. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and again, even though my instructors came from within, human nature is human nature. Yep. Okay. And again, it's hard to maintain the philosophy when you got people buying you gifts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Treating you like you're, you're the Messiah. Okay, bowing to you every single day. Mm -hmm. And what makes it worse is you have people like physic doctors, lawyers, people of power doing that to a young guy or a young woman. Yeah. How can it not get to your head? And that's how, I main that's how I maintain. And in those days, I could give them a beating. Okay, I'd spar with the instructors if I saw their ego was kind of really getting a little bit too much. Today, you can't do that anymore. But, but and I don't mean that egotistically either. Mm -hmm. You know, it, they'd be good for another six months. You know, it's always like, yeah. So that's how I did it because I was in, the, I had them every month. Mm. I could rotate every month to those three states and it, I could see what they were doing because yeah. as they get more involved a little bit in the test, I could really see that come out how they're doing things. Okay. 
And that's how I maintained. Okay. And I had managers in each state. Mm. And there were times they got out of control because they were in charge of the state. So that's what I did. Can you control everything? No, no. You know, we're a product of our past. You know, in psychology, it, it's proven that from zero to three, three to six, six to nine, by the time a, a, your child, do you have kids? Yeah. By the time a child is nine years old, especially women, who they're going to be, what they're going to be is done. Mm -hmm. 80% done for the rest of their life. Wow. And it's because what, what I like to call the informative years, from zero to three, three to six, it's called the unconscious and three, zero to three is unconscious. The baby, the infant cries. You're the parent. One of two things. They're hungry, they're wet, or both. They don't know why they're crying. They're just crying. They can't, they don't have the cognitive skills for that. You change them, you feed them, and they stop crying. Yeah. Now we're talking about right from that to we can go all the way almost to, almost to nine, but especially the worst years or the best years are from birth to six. Mm. Because at that stage, when you get to be like four years old or three years old, even two years old, they know what they don't like. Mm. I don't like that, but they don't know why. So if they're being abused, if their parents are doing whatever, anything, and they don't, they know that they don't like it, but they don't have, well, how could I at, 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 at five, six years old, Okay, understand why my father was abusing a, a woman with no legs and abusing me. How could I know that? I know they were doing it. I know I hated it. I cried. But I don't know why he was like that. And that dictates who we're going to be for the rest of our lives if we don't recognize that early on. And that's why I studied psychology. Mm -hmm. I didn't study psychology to change people's lives. I studied my psychology and, and, and all those years to know why I do what I do, mm. to understand why my father did what I do, did, because I hated him. Mm. I, I, I went to kill him one day, literally physically kill him. How old were you? 16. Mm. That's a long story, but I won't get into it. I did. Sure. I, I, I was physically going to kill him because of what he's done. Mm. And... As I got older, I didn't do it. But as I got older, and if I did, I wouldn't admit it. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a very I, different conversation. Yeah. As I got older, uh, my stepfather became a psychologist. Mm -hmm. He was an alcoholic. He was drunk every day. But he became a psychologist, and we worked for like a year and quit. But uh, he would talk to me about, and I hated him, but uh, he would talk to me about some of the cases he had as a kid. And it just fascinated me. And he had the Boston Strangler as one of his patients. Oh, wow. And he would talk to me about the Boston Strangler. And it made me think about what got that guy to do other than being psychotic? What got, what, what, what was it? And then it made brought it back to myself. Like, why do I have these habits? Okay, why? why? And that's when I started really researching. And that's what brought me into psychology. Because it didn't. You're never going to change somebody. Mm. You're not. By the time a, a teenager is 13 years old, if you're not living with that person, if you're not on them every single day, I've had 23 kids living in our homes in, in our marriage mm. from out, outside kids. Okay. They will never change because that's zero to nine. And then beyond nine, a coach can have a devastating effect on the kid if he was sexually abused or he sat on the bench all the time and kept telling him he was a great player, but he never played. Okay. So coaches and teachers, but up to nine, it's, it's usually the parent. And that's what got me into psychology. I just want a definition. Why do people do what they do? Mm. I not for them. I mean, that was got me for a graduate degree, but like in the first two or three years of undergrad, I mean, it's, I mean, what am I studying Western civilization for and, and college? And why am I studying math? Okay. Why am I studying trigonometry? Okay. Cal you know, calculus. I mean, I couldn't even spell trigonometry coming out of Brockton High School. I was surprised I even got into college because I worked full time. Where did you go? Brockton High. No, for college. Oh, you, um, uh, UMass Dartmouth. Okay. And that, yeah. And then I got my master's degree in Connecticut, University of Connecticut. But uh, yeah, I mean... 
I just wanted more definition mm -hmm. because I mean, I haven't even touched on what, how abusive my life was with my mom. And, it, and, and you just don't, you got to, in order to make a change uh, past 13 years old, and especially as an adult, you got to know, you got to deep, and you, it's like looking in the mirror and saying, this is a, a this is a, a behavior that I hate, but I can't stop doing it. And it's not done overnight. It's the first sure. thing is like AA. AA. Mm. You never, they keep, call, even the ones that don't drink for years are still getting up saying, I'm an alcoholic. So that's for an adult. That is so, so hard. It was painful for me. I mean, I had habits that I won't talk about those on levels. Sure. I didn't, you know, I didn't hurt people. I wanted to, <laughs> but, but I, that was very difficult for me to have to say to myself, Steve, this, this is so bad what you do. Mm. It's not only damaging to the people around you. And I've always been good to people. I'm a very generous person. I, it's my mom. Mm. Okay. But it was more, it was more detrimental to me. But to admit that when you're 20, 25, 30, 40 years old, very, very painful. I've worked very hard. I'm not there. I'm, I'll never totally be there because there's things that just never leave you. But I've been able to use that because there's not a kid on this planet. Uh, no, excuse me, not this planet, in the United States that can sit in front of me and tell me something that I haven't already been through. And that gives me the ability to help them because I've been able to do this with myself. What, what I'm, if that all makes sense. It does. And, and if I, what I'm hearing, and I, this is something that I think a lot of us do. What I'm hearing is you've worked hard to be the person that you needed when you were a kid. Yeah. And I was that for my kids. That was that for my kids. My wife homeschooled all three boys, which I was totally against at the beginning until they, so that's another story, but I don't want to deal with it. Uh, it's too long. Sure. But I, she homeschooled. She was brilliant. I told you. CIA yeah. tried to recruit her right out of college. Yeah. And and humble. Forget about it. I mean, this woman is brilliant. I mean, she, 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 I, I, she put me under a rug with her brain. She still does. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to a point with her. I can't, I don't, I don't, dis, I, I disagree and I start to argue my point and I just stop because I know, I swear to God, I know right from the beginning. She's going to be right. She's always right. And I'm not going to win, even if I still think I'm right. Yeah. But uh, my kids, I remember walking, and this is the same, you know, and why, you know, it's like they're saying, oh, well, she's talking about life story. Well, the life story. The, the, the examples, the, the, the things that we've had to do, I did and we did, pertains to how, back to the beginning when you, you know, about how I, how, what the philosophy is of, the, of my organization right. and how I train my instructors. So I'm one of the, I had twins. So they're this big. And we're walking into a, into a store. I mean, a department store. And we go through the, the door and I turn, I, I go, and, and Kelly's not there. My right. wife's not there. Right. I said, where's Ma? And we turn around and she's standing outside the door. I said, boys, you know what mom said? And I, it hit me that the three of us walked in that door without opening the door for her. And it's not that my, that my wife needed the door open. The woman was a state long jump champion. She's, a, she's an she's athlete. capable of opening the yeah, door. Yeah, she's capable of opening the door. <laughs> but it was, it's those kind of lessons are what form my boys. And to this day, they still, they, my boys are 32, the twins, and Gianni's 26, okay? They open the car door for their wives and their girlfriend, Johnny with his girlfriend. And they still, to this day, will not walk into a place before their mother does. How many people do that? So if you take that philosophy, that training, I don't even say philosophy, training, and bring that to the studio, You could have 10 students or you could have 500 students. Still make an impact. A huge impact. Let's talk about your training. So boxing, leaving home at 16, 
college, and if I heard you correctly, it was after college you started, let's call it traditional no, martial arts. No, I did it in college. Okay. How, how did how did you oh, get that was great. that? Um, I, 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 when I, living in Brockton, okay, it was in college. I don't know whether it was in my first year, probably my first year, because I was looking for something anyway to train, and I never even thought about karate, okay? Never thought about it, okay? It wasn't that popular then. So this, I, I, had, I, I hadn't seen this kid from high school in a long time. We went to, I went to college and whatever he did. And his, I saw him, his mouth was all wired. I said, Jesus, what happened to you? He said, I was fighting full contact competitively. And this guy knew how to use his hands. And he did this to my face. Because most karate guys, especially at that time, didn't know how to... I mean, I still see it today where they're punching from their, sh their shoulders and not here with the whole body. Yep. And he said, I said, wow. And he knew I was a boxer, a uh, former boxer. And he said, and I still boxed. But uh, he said, if you teach me how to box, I go to the school. You come to the school, I'll teach you for free. And it was a, it was a Weiji Wu school, Matson Academy of Karate. That was my first school. Yeah. And that's how it started. I mean, I didn't even think about it. You know, I said, okay, that sounds good. I mean, this is like, oh, that's great. Let me do this. I just needed something because I was trained boxing, amateur boxing is three punches basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Six days a week, two, three hours a day. Okay. That's it. That's it. Because you, you can do, either look at that as very simple or three, very boring. You think three rounds is not a lot. Three rounds in a real boxing match is a lot. It's exhausting. That's why you train so hard. So I said, yeah, I'll do that. And uh, Madison Academy had a great reputation. I found out later because I, again, I wasn't into martial arts. But I loved it because it was hardcore. Mm -hmm. The training, I mean, it's a simple, I'm not simple system, but in terms of being a beginner, it was simple. You know, in terms, there wasn't a lot of technique, mm -hmm. you know, Weiji Ru, <clears throat> the Okinawa style. I mean, the Japanese are known for like less technique and better at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's why Japan beat China. You know, they have a thousand weapons. And what do the Japanese say? What's the first thing you think about a weapon with a Japanese? Sword. Samurai sword. Exactly. And their steel was better than China's. But uh, anyway, I loved it. I loved it. I mean, we were, th you know, that was hardcore in those days. With, you know, but anyway. So we're talking about the 80s. Yeah, no, I'm, talk I'm old. I'm talking about the 70s. Okay. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, okay. did you, no, no, I didn't want to say I'm, that. I'm doing, <laughs> I did my math badly. <laughs> I didn't want to okay. say that. Oh, right, no, so. I like your math. <laughs> <laughs> sure, we can shave off 10 So that's how we, it happened. We can make as old as And then want. one day, so now I'm a green belt. Okay. And I was selling shoes going to school, college, selling shoes to make some money. I always made money, um, even in high school. I mean, I, we had split sessions. I was working 40 hours a week in high school, okay? I used to have to bake some of my teachers. I, I always wanted to go to college because no Damasco had ever gone to college, and that's another story. But um, I, I, I always knew I wanted to go to college, so I took college courses in high school. And, I, I, you know, I, I skipped school a lot. So... I would, you know, I, I would do well on tests. I was fairly intelligent, but not, you know, not, not my wife. But uh, I, I mean, I would be, be I, there were a couple of classes that I needed for college that were between a, a high D and a low C. And I would, I would beg the teacher, say, look at it, you don't give me a C. I can't go to college. And they would give me the C. I mean, what a difference did it make to them? <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so I'm a green belt and I'm selling shoes. And this kid comes in, he knew me from school. And he says, yeah, I'm at this Kempo school. And uh, I said, what is that? What, what is that? What do they do? What do you do? Now, I, I mean, I had one, I think as a green belt, I had two forms, not really much technique. And he goes, yeah, we study the tiger, the crane, you know, the leopard. We do the, you know, I mean, it was crude anyway, but still, I went, wow. And, I, and I'm ADD, as you can probably tell. And, and I'm saying, wow. So I need stimulation mm. and he's telling me about all these animal techniques i said this is great i love that so i went up to the school i went up to the to the kempo school so was this so new england 70s is this brockton this is in the 70s yeah is this nick serio no i you know nick there was another story okay. i was already a master and i met nick and he asked if he, we could work out together so i worked out with him every week for a year i, I never met him but i've Night, always heard great amazing guy. things great guy yeah. great guy uh but anyway so I'm like thrilled about this. Like I, I was just fascinated. So I'm young. I'm 18 or 19, 18 years old. I walk into the school. Okay. I had a lot of, I was very humble at that time. 
And I sat down in the chair and I looked at the instructor and I said, why should I study with you? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, <clears throat> I was, and I was a green belt and I'm a fighter. So I could fight. I mean, I beat up a lot of karate guys that were, you know, because we fought hard in those days. Sure. Okay. And they didn't know how to use their hands. So if I and, closed... and for those who don't know, Wei Chi was known for being yeah. kind of tough, a lot of conditioning. Oh, God. They were killers. But I loved it. Okay. Because boxing was like, you know, right. training was like that. So he looked at me and he said, I'm not going to swear, but he looked at me and said, you, you shouldn't. Get the F out. <laughs> I, and then I knew, I, I, was, I came back and I said, think to myself, this is the place I need to be. <laughs> and that's how I started getting into Kempo. Mm. I was the black sheep of the, it was a Valari school, okay. but I was the black sheep of the, of, of the Valari organization. That, the Valari oh, organization started in the 70s? It was that called was United like... Studios. Okay. Okay. At that time. And Fred changed it to Fred Valari Studios years later. But uh, um, so, yeah. So anyway, I loved it. I, I loved studying Kempo, but why? Uh, why was I the black sheep of the family? Okay. One, I left Kempo because it had, I mean, I, I, I worked hard on my kicks. Mm. I mean, I never stretched, you know, I, I didn't start stretching. We didn't stretch in boxing much. We ran, we did, you know, strength. And when I started Wei Wu and I started doing the stretching, holy shit, I couldn't even touch my toes. So, and it hurt. But uh, where was I in this? Why you love Kempo? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, oh, no, why I was the black sheep of the oh, family. Yeah of the Fred Valari, because Fred, you know, they call Fred a cult. And I don't think many organizations like that have organizations is much different, but, but he didn't want anybody studying outside the system, mm -hmm. but I saw the flaws. I love the technique, but I saw the flaws in the training. And why did I see the flaws? Because years later, I found out that Fred never, that Fred went, Nick Serial was Fred's instructor. Nick never badmouthed Fred. That's how nice a guy he was. A Christian. That's how nice a guy he was. But he said to me, "Fred only went to honorary second degree black belt, yep. and he never took any lessons." We, we when we were big and had three hundred and fifty schools, we would make up stories about Fred being in Puerto Rico and taking on ten guys, or whatever. You know what I mean? And because Fred had a bad reputation with the martial art world. Mm -hmm. And but he was a multimillionaire. I mean, mm -hmm. he was brilliant. There were, you know, so so of the that's why knows, I was a black. I grew up in Maine. Yeah, and you know there were. Valari I had twelve schools. schools. I had eleven schools in Maine. Okay, and no part of Maine. Uh, I grew up just north of Portland, hour north yeah. of Portland. And there, there was there was a Valari school in a town called Wyndham, which was not that far from me. My first school in Port, it was Portsmouth. Okay, I mean Portland, Portland, Portland. Portland. Yep. Uh, but Valari schools had a reputation as promoting quickly and yeah, yeah. giving um, fairly novice martial artists their own schools. I can tell you we didn't promote quickly, okay? Because, and I'll tell you why, and not to, not to defend it, because I have no desire to, for, to defend Fred. This is all third, fourth, fifth hand stuff. Uh, I have no um, idea. Everything else was correct. Oh, okay. I mean, what can you teach if you got the grand, the master, or whatever you wanted to call Fred, okay, the head guy, and only went to honorary second? The only ones he promoted quickly were the two guys that ran his company. And I don't want to mention their names. You know nope. who they are. Yep. So everybody else, they would hold us back. I mean, we would go for green, uh, I don't want to say green belt, and it could take years mm. because they didn't want to give the rank. Mm. They didn't want anybody getting that close to them. Mm. And the higher we got, because they had at some point promote us, the higher we got, the higher they, way, higher they got. I remember being at a workout, a Fred Valley workout, when the only instruct, with the only instructors, and he didn't know I was standing behind the door over there. And he told, he said, Charlie, Fred, come on in. It's time to put it, put another stripe on. Because we were getting rank at that time. So, yeah, I mean, so we didn't, other than those guys, and I'm not going to talk about them as martial artists. I don't do that. But, but what I will say is those are the only people. We weren't a bell factory. It appeared to be a bell factory because we had so many schools. Mm. But they held us back all the time. Interesting. All the time. Okay. Because they didn't want us that close. So you were talking about being being the black sheep and seeing some because of the flaws I studied at, I saw the flaws. So did that have a? 
I went to Chinatown. on how they treated you? Oh, yeah, totally. So were you held back even My more My black than belt others, test, or? I'm survived. I, I physically, physically survived it. And I don't mean from endurance, because I always worked out hard. Uh, for endurance, because of boxing, I had that training in my sure. head. Um, Fred Fred had this horse whip that he would use in those tests, and he would always hit somebody. But me, he beat that shit out of me with that horse whip because he knew. Start, I started as a purple belt training in Chinatown, mm. and I never stopped. That's how I got to China. That's why I, I got to train with the, the head head ma- master in the Shaolin Temple for twenty years. Okay. So you were cross training in kung fu? Yeah, okay. yeah, and I have always thought that was a weak system because all the Chinese martial artists I saw looked weak to me. I mean, they had pretty forms, but they were weak. Then there was this one guy I got invited. I'll tell you how cocky I was. Okay, Debbie Mangoni, which was Larry Mangoni, okay, wife was big into China. She was a big sister for Chinese. She loved the Chinese people. They loved her. Mm-hmm. She was Italian, and I don't know why I said that, but anyway. She she said you gotta. I said she said you should you should look at this. You should look at this 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 system. I said Debbie, these people can't fight. I was a fighter, okay. When I was tra- I remember going up for my green belt, brown belt, and Charlie came to give us that. We were terrified because we had all these stories, and I did my form, and they laughed. Not that their form was any better, but my form sucked. Mm. I wasn't into forms, mm. okay. I was into fighting, you know, and the technique. So. She says, this guy, Chan Poi, from the Walam system, he said, you got to come to this. And it was a big, they had a big hall. I mean, they rented a big place. He was, I didn't know he was that big and they're on stage. So I walk by and I'm walking to the, my seat and Chan Poi is sitting over here. And Debbie says, that's Chan Poi. Now he looked like he weighed probably from sitting down 130 pounds soaking wet. And I said, I looked at Debbie. She, I had no ego, right? I looked at Debbie and I said, I'll kick his ass. <laughs> You know, so I'm looking at that. I, I went because Debbie, I love Debbie. I loved her. And uh, so I'm watching these martial artists on stage. I'm not that impressed. Then one of his one of his top people that came from Hong Kong with him, his name was Yali. Not Yan Li, Yali. And he does this form. He's 5'11", mm-hmm. weighed about 180 pounds. And he does this form called the swallow form. I didn't know what it was called at that time. I looked at him and I said, holy shit, the power that this guy did. I mean, there's one move where you jump up in the air, throw your kicks and land on your knee, like your knees almost. I learned that form. I ripped my knee when I did it, but uh, <laughs> I did. I ripped my cartilage. <laughs> okay, so that was ego. I shouldn't have been ready for that form. <laughs> okay. I don't think it was the form I learned at that time. I think I was just trying to move. So, but it was, he was powerful. Don't try that move. He was, don't try that move. He was powerful. And I said, and I'm a power guy. I said, that was the first guy that I, Marsh, Chinese, that I said, I want to study with him. And I was a purple belt, I think, or green belt or something in Gembo. It was already green belt in, uh, in Reiji Ru. So I went to a school. And I, before that, I went, actually, I started before that. I started with Yan Li, Yan Li. And Debbie, was, Yan Li never liked me. To this day, I don't think he liked me. But, uh, uh, he's the one that taught at Harvard for years. Anyway, he she he taught trained me privately only because Debbie wanted him to. Mm-hmm. He loved Debbie. They all loved Debbie. So, but it was a three hour lesson, one hour of Chinese medicine because that's their philosophy. I didn't know one hour of cooking for meditation, and then I get forty five minutes to an hour of the uh, the uh, the mantis. Okay, but his mantis wasn't strong. But I studied with him. Let me tell you. How, let me tell you the philosophy. I went up to him one day and I said, "Why is um, uh, shifo? Why is it that the more I stretch, the tighter I get?" He looked at me and said, "Stretch more." <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for this philosophical yeah, answer. Big and deep. Okay, but he, you know, and that was it. And then when I saw this Yan Li, Yao Li. Okay, I, I do everything wrong in the beginning. It always. Mm-hmm. I don't know how I do it. I just happen to walk into this stuff. So I go in and I'm going to impress Yan Li, Yao Li, about that I've already studied with Yao Li. Wait a minute, he's Yao Li, Yan Li. I had already studied with Yan Li. So 
What do I do? I go and say, yeah, I've been studying privately with uh, 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 Yan Li. And I saw this look on his face. He hated him. <laughs> How do I do it? He was one that came over. The two of them came over from Hong Kong, I found out later. And, and y- y- <laughs> the Yan and the Yao get to me. The Yan Li left Shampoy and started his own thing. They hated him. Mm. Of all the things I could have said, yeah. I said the wrong thing. So that's how it started. But I, 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 I took, I, I had my own school at that time too. Mm. A little later, I had my own school, and I drove from Concord to Boston every single week for fourteen years, wow. and trained privately mm. with him. Did you Did you ever cross paths with Balsam Mark? Oh, I, I I know Paul Bosin Mark very yeah, well. I, I, I but I uh, but when be, I say you know who she that. you know she is. I do. Yeah, I mean she was she was commissioned by the by the country of China mm-hmm. to start that combined Tai Chi. Mm-hmm. But Larry at a time when women were not recognized yeah, for doing anything. Yeah, but they commissioned her. She because she was that. Who's good. that Kempo? That that I mean that. Uh, um, Wing Chun guy that does in all the movies. What's his name? Donia? That's his what? That's son. His mom. Yeah, that's his mom. And yeah. his and a, and and the daughter mm-hmm. was famous in the, uh, the the Chinese the Kung Fu Olympics. Mm-hmm. Famous, yes. but anyway, great. You know, they. I mean, he's great, Donnie. He is. And but Larry Mangoni has been studying from her. I don't know if he still does because he's going. He's getting old now. But for probably 30, 40 years, privates every week. So that's how that's how I knew about her was through Larry. Yeah, and I met her once. She was very gracious, you know. She was very yeah, nice. I I was lucky enough to spend a little bit of time that's with her great. and Chris and, yeah. and get some stories. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool day. Yeah. Um, so that's gonna... why I was the black sheep of the Valari organization for years until I started making Fred money. Okay, uh-huh. then he loved me. Everything for Fred was about money. So, um, but yeah, that's why because I I met once as I started with Yan, with Yan Lee. As a blue belt, mm-hmm. so and I never stopped in, in, in dungeon. That's how I got invited to China. Mm-hmm. When I was I, I was I was a spokesperson for, for education, gangs, school violence for the president of the United States, mm-hmm. and the only president I think China's ever really liked because I see his pictures when I went there the first time was Bill Clinton, and I was invited as a guest because we had just blown up, and I was working with the FBI then too, but we had just blown up one of the ambassadors. They're always mad at us for something. The CIA did not have the intel that one of their ambassadors was in a hit they were doing. Mm. So again, they want to kill us. But because of my, because of the ones I studied with in Chinatown, they knew those masters. And then the fact that I was a, I was a, a representative of Bill Clinton, I got in, That's how I got to Shaolin mm. Temple. They took me everywhere. They picked me up in a. They flew me in first class, and they picked me up in a, in a general's limo. Here I am in a general's limo. Okay, with the big red star on the front, with two Chinese, no, I don't want to say bodyguards, but translators and stuff. Mm-hmm. It was unbelievable. They took me everywhere. Beijing University. They did you well. Oh, my God. And then the last stop was the uh, Shaolin Temple. Cool. So that's how it started. And I went there every year for 20 years. I think we're going to have to have you back on. <laughs> this is, this I'm is sorry the, to get carried no, away, but no, as soon as you say something, apologize. when you ask this a question, great. it's like triggers all, you know, yeah. something else. Well, that, that's what and we do on good this question. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. This yeah. has been a lot of fun. And, and I know we've gone over a time, so. But that's okay. Other than, you know, we've got, we've got one of your guys no, he, that we're, we're going to bring in. It's Sunday. And, and, yeah, and he's a good guy. Turn you back to your family and everything. But we'll, I can tell we've scratched the surface, so we're going to have to have you back on it at some point. If people want to follow what you're doing, your schools, what's the website? This, if they want to follow what I do, what I do, the website is the, 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 the website we use for the states that we're in is SDSS, Steve Damasco Shaman Studios, right. SDSS Kung Fu okay. com. But if they're interested in what I do, because hmm. I had to have the white house gave me a publicist hmm. because I lectured all over the country for oh, the president. Cool. So I had to have this, yeah, you know, and that's just stevedamasco.com. Okay. So they can do whatever they Great. want. We'll, we'll get that stuff in the show notes. Okay. Uh, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Make sure you go check out everything, all the links. I mean, we're probably going to be a lot coming out of today. And this this worked out. I mean, I, I be honest with you. I mean, it's Sunday. I'm Catholic. 
and I came from church to here. Well, I so I don't that. do these. No, I wasn't saying it for that. It's just that I don't do, my wife and I don't do anything on Sundays. But I had promised, Mark really wanted me to do this. Yeah. And I and I'm really. This glad, is why. And I'm really. Got... I'm, no, I, I'm really glad I did. This was the, the things that we talked about. The things yeah. you asked me. I'm, I'm, I I I really enjoyed this. Good. Thank you. So I always ask the guests to to kind of close us up. So you know the audience is is still hanging on. What what do you want to leave them with? You know, final thoughts, words, summary. You know, something of that nature. What I do you want to tell them? Everything to me is is. I have an honorary doctorate degree hmm. in philosophy. Um, and. I, I, this is my mantra. What we do, truly, and I think by listening to me, you'll believe what I'm, that I believe this. What we do in this lifetime that goes on to eternity. And I have a foundation for inner city kids. Nobody gets paid. All the money that I get, I give to not just martial artists, martial arts schools, but they have to have a, it could be boxing, be anything, as long as they have a strong mentoring program. So everything in my life is a movie that came from Gladiator. Mm -hmm. And I named my, and I named my foundation, the strength and honor foundation There's a website for that. It's just strength and honor.org. And that came from the Gladiator movie. I love that movie. movie. It's a good movie. So that, that's it. What we do in our lifetime, the, the, the effect that we have on these people that we train from kids to adults will, will, will carry on to eternity. Awesome. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Appreciate it. It was great.